I, I guess you're finally settled back in Washington again, are you? I am. It took a while to get back. <laughs> I bet it did. So where have you been recently? So we saw each other in China. And before that, we did a world tour uh, meeting with certifications around the globe um, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, Germany, and uh, Costa Rica. Excellent. So uh, this has been an incredible year for you, hasn't it? It has been quite um, interesting. As, as you know, <laughs> we had a very successful launch of the global sustainable tourism criteria in 2008. And since that, the adoption um, of the criteria for so many purposes we had not anticipated um, has been very rewarding. And that has led our partnership group to build the Tourism Sustainability Council, which we hope to launch in the following months. So I think I remember talking to you, I mean, it must have been years ago when the Global Sustainable Tourism Criteria was first mooted. Um, how has that progressed in the last year? So we have um, several different ways in which the criteria have developed. Uh, one is the decision by the Sustainable Tourism Stewardship Council to use the criteria for accreditation of certifications. Um, that led to the merger of the partnership of the Global Sustainable Tourism Criteria with the STSC. The second uh, element of this, and one of the most rewarding, is the adoption by countries that are looking to build policies or sustainable tourism programs uh, using the GSTC. So in the U.S. alone, 172 cities uh, signed an agreement to use GSTC in their efforts to introduce sustainable tourism in their programs. Um, we've had collaboration with the government of Egypt, Costa Rica, and are now in talks with about five or six other governments. So that has been an unexpected outcome. As you know, the criteria were designed to guide businesses that were looking at implementing sustainable tourism programs and identify a common language that they could use. Uh, another outcome that is very rewarding is the adoption of the criteria um, by the Inter-American Development Bank, who used it to develop a scorecard for investment in uh, sustainable tourism development. Um, and this scorecard is now being adopted by UNEP in their efforts to look for, for a more uh, systematized um, way to introduce sustainable tourism on the finance and development side. Okay, but that's, that's incredible achievements, isn't it? I mean, you're just going at a pace. When I saw you at, um, at Beijing, um, you were huddled up most of the time in uh, in meetings with your uh, with your committees, and um, I'm really impressed by the fact that you're rolling out. I mean, even when I was in Africa earlier on this year, somebody from the um, Sustainable Tourism Global Sustainable Tourism Criteria was down there um, organizing meetings with tr Fair Trade Tourism South Africa. So, I mean, this is dramatic growth, isn't it? It is. It was, as I said, unexpected for us, the different um, turns that the criteria took and just demonstrated how ripe it was in different sectors to have that common language. Yes. Uh, and the, the, as far as I can understand it, I'm sure you'll tell me if I'm wrong, 
Um, it is a common language, not a set of common rules. It is not a certification, and there is a belief out there that that's what we are, and it's not. It's, it's a set of principles that will feed eventually into an accreditation system for that niche that looks at certifications. But what I explained before was the intent all along for the global sustainable tourism criteria, is to find a way by which we can all align around some core principles. They're general. They're not intended to be indicators uh, or specific um, measurements, just uh, as you pointed out, principles and guidelines. Yeah, I think I, I said language rather than rules, because I'm assuming uh, that like a good language, uh, that, um, that this is being changed all the time. It's not kind of set in stone. That is correct. We followed um, the ICL code of conduct that requires us to have constant feedback to the criteria and and there are procedures and this year actually we will take all the feedback received and open up for another wide consultation process and it's very interesting because we've had the different adoptions of the criteria to particular realities um, one of the most exciting for me that I learned of this year is an effort in Thailand where several communities came together with government and the certification in Thailand to look at the criteria, analyze it from their perspective. So, so we're talking about businesses that have maybe two rooms, three rooms um, that are not the audience that we were addressing at the beginning with the criteria. And what they did is went through it and adapted it to their realities. And that, to me, demonstrates that a common language transcends sites or revenue. It's, there is a, an understanding and a willingness, even at a community level, to do the right thing and to implement sustainable tourism practices that um, their realities are different from a large hotel in a city, but it doesn't mean that they can just say, oh, we don't have the money, we can't do this. They can and they want to, and that addresses one of the myths out there that we can't work at a community level or at a, at a small operations level to implement sustainability practices. So you're saying that this is really not only a global thing, but it transcends the SME, ME barriers. In other words, it goes from small businesses to big ones. That's correct. And everybody can afford it because it doesn't cost anything at the moment? Uh, to implement the criteria, no. If you are a certification, we're currently working on the accreditation system, and that will have some costs and fight, um, very much like the FSC model or the MSC model for forestry and marine. Yeah, uh, I mean, one thing that I'd ask you about, this, because it's a question that I keep on asking about the uh, certification level, um, uh, if, it, if it gets to that stage, um, uh, and I did ask some of your committee members about it earlier on, and that is to say, uh, will there be uh, some kind of certi self-certification, or, will, or um, will the certification always be an inspection-based thing? So by definition, certification is a third-party verified um, process. So what the Tourism Sustainability Council is looking at is certification is a niche. It's, it's something that allows us to verify the claims, which unfortunately is a reality not only in this industry, but in all industries. That's why certifications exist. Um, but for us to move that 95% of the rest of the industry that is not being certified, our members believe that we're looking at a process. So we need to work with all industry at all levels 
and there will be cases where hopefully we can get to that verification to ensure legitimacy and, and credibility, which even the industry has recognized is very important. Um, but the, the focus of the council is to achieve that process, is to work with those that can start with a self-assessment to evaluate where they are and help them move up the ladder with the many tools that exist out there. We don't need to invent the tools. The tools are out there and even uh, in the last two years using the, the criteria, many more tools have been developed that adapt to the realities, the regional realities or the uh, type of sector we're talking about. So our role as we see it is, is to help mainstream sustainability. Okay, so, but, but what you're actually saying is that um, you will accredit certifiers, isn't it? Yes, we will. Um, and have you got a bunch of certifiers that you're ready to accredit now or not? I think there are a couple that are very close aligned with the criteria. And as and I mentioned at the beginning of, of this conversation, we have met with about 60 of the certification, of the hundred and 27 certifications we have identified yeah. and um, some are close to adapting to the criteria some are a little bit further behind one of the biggest challenges that we face in this process is that often sustainability is equated to environmental compliance and we see sustainability from the environmental socio-economic and cultural perspective and that's where we need to find a way to uh, work with certifications that are usually more focused on the green side to meet all those other elements which we believe are part of the pillar of sustainability. Which are? The socio-economic and the cultural side. Okay, so you're looking at, um, at the sustainability as being a holistic thing, aren't you, really? I mean, that's the idea about the global sustainable tourism criteria, because, I mean, if we were to read them out, uh, then uh, we'd be here all afternoon, wouldn't we? I mean, they do cover every area of operation. They cover those pillars. Yeah, uh, and um, it leads me on to, when you were saying about the accreditation, it leads me on to one um, issue that we, we, we recognise here probably in the United Kingdom, possibly more than anywhere else, and that is that um, the um, uh, ICRT has been um, um, given the job by, the, uh, by, visit, uh, by visit Britain um, of accrediting the certifications um, and that, that in precisely the same sort of job that you're doing globally yes. um, and uh, they've only accredited the one thus far which is a bit of a problem because it means that uh, because it's a one stop, one, one stop shop and a little monopoly going there um, you'll excuse me saying that but I mean that's uh, that's obviously the uh, the case um, and uh, you are encountering criticism from the um, ICRT. At the, well, it has been going on for the last few months, hasn't it? Yeah. I think you raise a couple of points that are very, very important. One of the things we don't want to do is we don't want to compete with those efforts. So the business model that we are developing actually works in collaboration with the national or regional um, accreditation systems and that's very important because um, for many businesses the regional or local accreditation is more significant than a global accreditation so if you are a chain or, or a larger hotel that has uh, businesses around the globe the value of, an, of a global accreditation to you will make more sense than if your customers are 90% from South Africa. So just to give an example. So that's one important point to raise. The other important point to raise is the number of businesses that actually get certified and then the number of businesses 
that gets certified by an accredited certification. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges to demonstrate the value of certification is that increase in volume. And uh, I don't have the answer to that, um, except that we have to start mainstreaming a lot more. And in that process, we need to be creative as the realities for certification in the tourism industry do not equal the models that we've followed uh, in other industry sectors. So you're saying that uh, organic and fair trade is uh, uh, being the main other industry sectors, are there not models that you would follow? Well, n not in that sense. So if you're looking at, I, I was talking more of forestry or oh. extractive industry or productive uh, or production, where you have one seal and um, you have a, a certain type of size or um, activity that can be modeled. But with so many sectors in the travel industry and with sizes ranging from renting out a bed to having 800 rooms, that, that presents different situations where you are dealing with different income, with different impact. And so it's not equated to forestry or mining. So it was, you're saying uh, that, um, that the global sustainable tourism criteria um, are applied um, with the knowledge of local conditions as well. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. So, so they're, they're that kind is of, true. I was trying to work the word, this kind of swerve to local conditions, yes? Yes. Um, so when the global sustainable tourism criteria are looked at, they need to look at, they need to be looked at like you did as a set of guidelines. Yeah. And they're not a certification. And they're not, they have guiding indicators that uh, uh, hotels can use or tour operators can use to develop their program. Mm. But they're not a certification and therefore there's no expectation except that local commitment um, to adapt it to the realities. Now if you want to go the certification route, then there will be more rigorous standards using the criteria. But they're not the same thing. The, the criteria are those principles that will inform the standards as they inform all the other programs in, in like the ones we mentioned for the governments and the ones we mentioned for the Inter-American Development Bank. So the example I gave of Thailand, it doesn't get more local than that. This is a particular region in Thailand working with small um, businesses that they've taken the criteria, modeled it, and actually are coming back to us with some incredible suggestions on how to make the criteria better. I mean, it seems to me to be a something that's progressing and changing all the time, isn't it? It is. It, that's the nature of the business and um, that's the nature of the criteria. Now, having said that, it's not that the criteria will change every day. As I said, we follow a process where we get that information and periodically the criteria will be revised. Because if you're adhering to the criteria or using it, you also don't want it to be so flexible that it becomes irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, okay, Erica, now I've got a bunch of questions, in particular those from Ron, uh, which I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, you can give a one-word answer or you can go on at length. And I, I'm sure that other people have got questions for you as well. Uh, the first one, that, uh, the first point, as it were, that Ron makes is he says... I'd really like to see a public showdown amongst the proponents and critics. So much of this is a good example of the digital echo room. Erica and her bunch talk to people who think they're all correct and she's not answering the criticisms of others. So that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, he says, beyond certification and criteria, we need to be asking how to integrate visitors and locals in the development. 
it's where we're already heading with TripAdvisor and now um, another interesting little movement, the local travel movement. So uh, would you like to say anything about either of those two points that Ron makes or um, not? I, I didn't understand the first one. On the second one, I completely agree. Uh, it's it, the only way we're going to move forward is if consumers start demanding um, uh, sustainable practices within the places that they go to. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that TripAdvisor has probably been the biggest development, the biggest yep. global development in the travel and tourism industry. I mean, everybody, nobody presumably thought it was going to be great to start with, and all of a sudden, everybody's at it. I mean, it, whatever its fault, it does involve um, the tourist in the tourism industry. Correct, but if uh, there, there was a recent survey where... Um, People want to do the right thing, but they don't know what that means. And so I think part of what all of the groups that are working out there have to do is to A, educate the traveler, and then B, rightfully, as Ron said, engage the likes of TripAdvisor to provide the travelers with the opportunity to judge those that make the claims. Okay, Eric, I'm going to let you off the hook because... Uh... Uh, otherwise, I'm getting a little comment from other people, and that Je Jeffrey has been uh, making comments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to drop you out of the Skype arena for the moment. I'll probably come back to you, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to Skype up um, Jeffrey to ask him some uh, some questions, and we'll start off nice and soft with him as well. But thank you very much for your uh, for your comments, here, Fran. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Look, I think the work that Erica and her colleagues have been doing for many years is, is very interesting, very honourable, and is, I'm afraid to say, going to be overtaken by the marketplace. And if, in my view, and it's not nothing to do with their commitment and the work that they're doing, Things move so quickly in this industry that a group of people trying to find serious criteria that apply globally and can then be put down locally are going to have to change things almost every day, regrettably, if they want to keep up to date with the habits of consumers and of technology. Point number one. Point number two, I don't see this as a situation where we have to create conditions where consumers will demand. I believe that over time, and increasingly quickly, consumers will need to demand, not because of the criteria that Erica has described, but because of the 800 pound gorilla in everybody's room, which is climate, which is going to force a changed approach to all the things we've all been looking at over the past 15 or 20 years. So I think under those circumstances, the work that's being done is admirable. As guidelines, yes, if it's going to be to be a master accreditation body for everybody, that's okay too. It's just another business in the tourism sector. Okay, um, so we, what you're saying is that the work that they're doing is admirable in the sense that they are um, taking the subject out into the wide, wide, wide world and getting people to talk about it, yes? Yeah, and identifying, synthesizing lots of work that many equally admirable people have been doing, including Ron Mader, including UNWTO, to establish kind of master lists of good behavior. And over time, you get a better list and a better list. My point only is that none of that work took into account climate. And climate will be a determinant because it will force regulation, taxation, and incentives, and it will come in a relatively rapid time frame. Okay, uh, so you're saying that all 
the, the key points of the um, of t- sustainable tourism, in fact, which is to say the economic, the social, and the um, and the cultural aspect and the environmental aspect of um, sustainable tourism, are all going to be taken over by the climate. Well, I, I think it's all going to be relevant, but I think it will be also that climate will have equal and increasingly greater weight than those other elements, and we'll have to adapt those elements to fit into the climate reality, which will cause major adaptation. We all know it. Everybody, you know, it's not what I'm saying. It's, it's what every piece of science is saying. Adaptation is going to mean quite form patterns of consumption and production, different forms of energy use for transportation, and for accommodation. So, well, you know, I think that this thing, my point is, this is changing increasingly uh, every day. You mentioned Europe. Last week we had George Soros suggesting that the UN group are going to talk about, you know, another set of taxes involving airline passengers. Um, how can you, whilst all those major shifts which will affect travel patterns are going to be moving forward, the, the criteria, in my view, are, are just good indicators which will have to adapt on a relatively market-based way, or they have to, which means local level, or they will just have to be eventually general criteria just like the WTO's indicators, which were the only things out there for a certain amount of time. But they didn't really get put into practice in the marketplace. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I understand exactly what you mean. But um, uh, there's been so much, and, and you also have been one of the great proponents of uh, sustainable tourism, haven't you? I mean, general economic and environmental and um, and social but sustainable. Still, I, I haven't changed. All I'm, I'm saying, in fact, all I'm just saying is, and I've said it for some time, if people are right about climate, that's the big if, and the changes that have to be made for climate, and you look at the changes, they are quite radical across all elements of, of our industry and all other industries and all consumer behaviour. Yeah. So, Against that change over 20, 30 years, I, I believe the criteria will be useful for identifying elements of, of the sustainability package. But if there's any thought that these are going to become something which are going to be sort of used by every travel and travel company as some sort of certificated framework, I personally have my doubts. I just think it's, it's become too market and climate driven. Yeah, uh, you have obviously spent a lot of time. I know that you spent a lot of time trying to understand the um, the climate um, the climate situation and how it's going to impact on the industry. Um, would you? What would you think? Given if the climate thing does happen in any uh, in any way that is significant. Over the next ten or twenty years, what what's tourism going to look like? What what are the major top three impacts? Well, it's the patterns of transportation, in my view, are going to to change. I think on the major markets of Europe, uh, North America, and China, there will be a lot of shift to high-speed trains and shift away from short-haul aviation. Secondly, I think we are going to get a major recognition by hospitality management that they can really shift the way they climate-proof their buildings. People haven't caught on to this yet, but this is probably the biggest area of energy utilization. And when the combination of regulation on the one hand and incentive on the other comes into play, I think you're going to see lots and lots of people who are going to make shifts in the right direction to reduce their energy output and demand. And the third thing 
I would say, is because money is going to be made available significantly to the poorer countries, you're going to see an increase in development in, in those countries. And there I think it's critically important that the kind of criteria that, um, that Erica was talking about are grafted into the climate requirements because those countries are starting in many cases from a relatively low base and they can make the shift to what I'll just call decent tourism, uh, clean, green, quality and ethical, I call it smart tourism. Um, I think we'll see a big demand for that kind of thing driven by entrepreneurs as much as by the marketplace deciding, but entrepreneurs realizing they can access government funding for the adaptation. Okay, I'd like to pick up on one thing. I'd like to pick up one point that you made. But let me just interject uh, something first. I've had a, uh, a comment from uh, Ron Mader. I think you should know this. So you might stay on your seat while I, while I say it. It's very short. It says, Jeffrey never ceases to amaze me. His comments are spot on. Um, I don't see why that is his source of amazement, but there you go. The fact that you're... The highly intelligent, handsome Ron <laughs> That's the highly intelligent, handsome Ron Mader. Um, anyway, the, 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 well, one thing I was, you said about the transportation is going to change. I mean, I noticed, we wrote the story a couple of weeks ago, uh, that the Chinese have bought a lot of Bombardier high-speed trains and they're planning to run them to, uh, to Western Europe. Um, I mean, that... So when you say short haul, um, that's a two-day, two-night, three-day, two-night journey, uh, you know, 150, 200, 300 kilometres an hour. I mean, is that the sort of thing that you're thinking about? Well, I was, I mean, I think that's almost long haul that you're talking about. Yeah, it about. is, yeah. And when you have a market the size of China and the potential to move people at comparatively low tariffs, I think you are going to get that. But there aren't many places that have a similar framework as China. But, you know, Europe, um, I live in Brussels. When I think of going now to Geneva, I look at the train compared to the plane. And I think there's going to be, as the prices of aviation get taxed higher, rightly or wrongly, as it gets taxed higher, then I think you're going to see a bigger differential and a lot more people shifting to, to transport. China is a world in its own because they very brilliantly have coupled their response to the stimulus with their, the need for economic stimulus with their realization that they have to be a major um, clean energy producer. So, of course, they've just mandated lots of high-speed trains. And that's going to be a huge difference in their carbon footprint and in their ability to offer um, good travel to Europe, yeah. And then I expect them to export that in the 20 to 40 year time frame around the world. Yeah, well, of course, going, oh, when you say around the world, what do you mean? Well, the, I, you know, the, there's no reason why good Chinese trains can suddenly become competitive with with Amtrak and, and offered to Amtrak if you end up with a world trade arrangement which, you know, makes it easy to get into all markets, including the US domestic. Yeah, I think that the, the trains that China have at the moment are ones that they bought from the Canadian company Bombardier. Um, yeah, but, they, you know, but they will make their own. Some of their aircraft, um, um, Valair, they, their aircraft also come from, from Boeing and Airbus, but a significant portion of them under the arrangement are Chinese material and Chinese ownership. And that will, you know, that portion will increase over time. I'm sure that's true. Now, Geoffrey, thank you very much for that. I'm sure you'll stay on the, on the line. Um, we have, uh, this has been recorded in your... Uh, and your three major uh, issues for the, uh, for the future have been um, uh, uh, duly noted, and I'm sure that they'll come true. I'm going to ask Ron if uh, this is Thank an appropriate you. time for him to, uh, to come in. Thank you very, very much indeed. I'm sure that everybody thanks you very much for your contribution. If you could stay around, I'd be most grateful. And uh, Nobody else has asked any, um, any questions at the moment. I think they're, uh, 
They're just fascinated by what you have to say. Uh, so, Ron, first of all, before I start asking you uh, questions that are pertinent to you, would you like to make some comments on what Erica and, uh, and Jeffrey have just said? Well, I'd like to go to the, uh, the uh, snide little comment I posted in text saying, I'd like to see some sort of a showdown between some of the proponents and critics of uh, the sustainable tourism criteria. I see a lot of posts that don't go that far on responsibletravel.com or on the ICRT blogs, and I see some outdated information and old info from the Global Sustainable Tourism Criteria website of its own. So it's all well and good that these folks have their meetings around the world and go talk about certification or not certification or criteria or not criteria, but they're not really kind of including the voices of people who have been a bit critical, including ICRT and Responsible Travel and myself. Uh, at the, at, the, at the base, I think we are after the same goals. The question is how we are getting toward them. Uh, do, we move, do we move towards this from a top-down scenario or one that's ground up? And it's hard doing ground up work. And living in rural Mexico, you know, frankly, I'm quite suspicious of most criteria and most certification programs. That said, a lot of what works in tourism here is done by the genuine interest and dedication of tireless folks on the ground, whether they're in the hotel industry or in transportation or in crafts and other cultural services. I'd like to see an opportunity for a frank and open discussion. And so far, at the major tourism meetings, I have not seen this. Now, saying all of that, you know, that was supplant, uh, supplanted by, by what Jeffrey said, and he does uh, amaze me, because we have to focus on climate change. That is the number one issue. We're still putting our head into the sand. And if we can start focusing on that as the key issue that will, that will focus our attention the next 10 to 30 years, and more so, but let's be honest, it would be easy to focus on what can we can do, what we can do in our own lifetime. Climate change is the key issue, and I'd like to pursue this conversation with Jeffrey and others to keep our focus uh, on, on those issues. Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey made, um, said about the three things that he thought were going to change in the travel industry. I mean, what would you think is going to change? You know, here, you know, here I am. I'm a gringo living in Mexico, and I'm not satisfied with the, the, the news during the Bush era in the United States about climate change. So I immediately went to look for information uh, from Europe, from England in particular, and quite a bit from Australia. And what's interesting in the discussions that I've listened to, uh, thanks to BBC and ABC, is the, the wonderful complexity of these issues and also the way that people are working toward climate proofing their businesses and industries. We're seeing so much debate that's unnecessary and uh, too, much, uh, too politicized. And I don't know the way around it, out of it, but we need to have that sort of a dialogue to figure out what we're going to do. I'd agree, I'd agree again with Jeffrey that things are changing so quickly that I'm going to spend your past minute and a half kind of dodging your question. You know, what will the big things, what will the big things be? Uh, personally, I see that we'll be focusing much more on slow travel. I think we're going to be much more engaged in dealing with locals, particularly after the older crowd uh, passes away. Uh, my parents are great, but I, the folks that I see visiting Oaxaca who are in their 50s or 60s, they don't really want to talk to local people. Conversely, the folks who are in their 20s and 30s, this defines their trip. So I think the slow travel and local travel movements are here to stay, and they're going to be uh, connected and integrated with our concerns and our interest in, in uh, preserving our climate. And that will create a, a number of niches in tourism that we haven't even begun to imagine. Okay, so you're looking at the positive side of things, really, but what about the negative side? I don't wouldn't like well, to take... Well, I, you know, um, my folks live in, uh, outside of Las Vegas, Nevada, and Las Vegas is one of the world's mecca for mass tourism. And it's also been quite uh, impervious to economic recessions until the past two years. 
it'll be interesting to see, you know, how um, mega destinations, resorts like Las Vegas or Cancun, uh, change their operations when the number of mass tourists starts to decline. Uh, how do they adapt? How do they change their their tourism services from something that uh, that's offered to people who are there for two or three days to people who might be there for two or three weeks? From people who might be staying at the budget hotel, whatever you know, whether it's a real budget budget or you know my favorite, the seven thousand dollar a night suites that go for four thousand dollars a night. You know, you know, a bargain's a bargain. Yeah, a bargain is a bargain. You're right. But, you know what happens when we see more and more growth in services like couch surfing? You know, we we are not prepared, in my belief, we're not prepared to really evaluate the statistics of the tourism industry as it stands now. How do we evaluate the impact of the tourism industry when the tourists are not spending for the hotel stay, but they're spending their money and their time in other areas? Okay, Ron, you've been to Las Vegas recently, I know, um, and you had a look at that city centre um, where the WTTC um, summit is going to be next year. Um, now, that is how the, the mass destinations are changing for climate change, isn't it? Well, in a way, and, and I would argue that the city centre is, is a very interesting and convoluted story in its own right. <laughs> uh, we haven't got time yeah, to go into that. What audacity to call yeah. a, you know, a private you know, a hotel complex the city center. Yeah. But uh, what it's done, it's done quite well in terms of green building and green construction. On my never-ending criticism of certification programs, uh, I'm really dissatisfied with the U.S. green building certification program. It doesn't have any information on their website about how the... Las Vegas City Center actually, you know, measures up to certain standards. You know, it keeps that information confidential. Yeah. And I would argue, again, that if we want to see effective and valuable certification, the information needs to be quite transparent, and the standards need to be accountable to somebody. And again, in the public view. Yeah, I mean, they do say that it got gold, um, gold, whatever it's called, with the U.S. US Green Building Council, yes? That's right. And you, you and, photograph and, 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 the... Some of the buildings have that, some of the buildings don't. Oh. And it depends, and it largely depends if you, have, if you can smoke or not. And <laughs> too many of the uh, people visiting Las Vegas, boy, they certainly they don't want to give up their smoking. They'll, they'll be hooked up on their oxygen machines, but they still have that cigarette. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's exact, that is a good... Um, Good way of describing the human race at the moment. They might they might be on their oxygen machines, but they don't want to give up the the benefits of not doing the climate change bit, do they, Renny? That is a great metaphor. Okay, Erica. So tell me, what do you think about all of that then? Yes, I I think um, first of all, I think this has been a great conversation, and I just want to reply to the particular comments that were made by Jeffrey and by Ron. Um, on the climate change issue, Jeffrey is right. Uh, it's definitely the one topic that we do need to address in, in this industry and other industries. And um, there are in important initiatives that have been moved forward at the level that Jeffrey is talking about. Um, UN, WTO, and UNEP are certainly taking a leadership um, joined by WTTC and the World Economic Forum on addressing more of the policy side and big picture side. But when you are somewhere in the country and you have a 10 hotel, a 10 bedroom hotel, then you want to know what you can do about it. And I think the criteria, or I know the criteria, are a good guideline for you to do that. If you look at section D of the criteria, you will see exactly what you can do related to energy, greenhouse gas. It's the way that the industry can translate that global discussion into a concrete action. So I think it's a combination of the different strategies that will address it. Um, Currently, the majority of the travel is still domestic, so 
There will be changes, yes, but I think overall we are looking at, at very similar scenarios for travel. There will probably be an increase in, in domestic travel, but, um, but I don't think it's going to be affected um, as radically in the short term. Uh, and in that time, we, we will definitely be able to help all the, the industry to ad adapt this uh, adapt to climate change and make their contribution using guidelines like the criteria. There's many more things, of course, they can do um, to contribute if they wanted to go the extra mile. Good. So what you're saying, Erica, is that, um, as we said at the beginning, that the, uh, the global sustainable tourism criteria are a language that everybody can adopt. Um, and um, it's not just a set of rules, so people can understand what sustainability is all about, yes? That's right, and, and not only understand it, but actually transform it in practical action. Um, so when you're looking at climate change, as I said, you're looking at Section D, which is the environmental section, and do something. But you can go beyond that, because while climate change is a global issue, the realities on the ground, depending on where you are, are, are different. So for many, clean water is a big issue. Yeah. And in a, in a recent survey that we did, actually that's what travelers are most concerned with, is access to clean water and how they can help um, communities to have access to clean water. So you look again at, at uh, Section D uh, and then also um, deal with the socioeconomic part where you are helping communities and where you are, you have concrete guidelines so that you can deal with um, water issues. Uh, those are the elements that we hope to address per pertaining to the realities of where these different um, operations are located in. Okay, so what you're saying as well is that this is an opportunity for people to um, become more sustainable, but also to uh, uh, to do a bit of good so that they provide a sustainability for a longer term. That's right. Okay, Erica, well, thank you very much. Is there anything else you wanted to add before, uh, before I, I wind up the, the, uh, the webinar? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, to Ron that we certainly welcome the conversation. So I think there is so much to do on sustainable tourism and the approaches can be different and, and they can coexist. Um, I agree that we need to engage communities, we need to engage uh, consumers. It is a very daunting task to engage consumers. Other industries have done it and uh, it has taken them years before the consumer had any awareness of, of doing the right thing. So uh, I think that it is important for us to all work together so that we can achieve the common goal. I'm sure we'll make it happen, taken by the, uh, by the contributions of everybody today. Uh, there's certainly a determination to make sustainability work. Thank you very much indeed, Erica. Thanks.